Okay, a more supportive union. Can EU create a new welfare bargain? That's uh, the topic of the next uh, session. Uh, in Europe, uh, we have a, a lot of unemployment see, right now uh, due to the financial crisis. And uh, in some countries, uh, young... Oh, sorry. May up to a, a fifth of the, the young population in Europe is uh, unemployed right now. And we have a lot of challenges um, also for the elder generation to stay in the labor markets. Um, and the discussion of welfare rights uh, is, of course, uh, one of the core issues that we also uh, deal closer with in the, the Brexit session afterwards. Uh, but right now, we'll have a discussion of uh, the mobility package uh, and the ideas of creating a some kind of welfare bargain, a new welfare bargain in, inside the European Union, and also how to handle the challenge of benefits tourism. Uh, that is, uh, of course, uh, causing a lot of tense political debates. We have a good panel here. Uh, Leonidas, you know him. He will go down from the philosophical level mm -hmm. and deep into the, the field of social affairs. Uh, with two good scientists in this field, uh, Jon Quist, professor at Roskilde University, and Dorte Sinberg Martinsen uh, from uh, University of Copenhagen. And first of all, I'd like to uh, ask Dorte to have a, a short presentation about this topic, and Thank also you. maybe to reflect a bit on the, the report of the new Pact for yep. Europe and yep. comments on that, please. Sure. Thank you very much, Bjarke. It's a pleasure to be here, and it has been an interesting a read of this new social pact for Europe, which also deals with the social dimension of the European Union. And that is, in my view, uh, needed to be addressed, especially from the political side. Uh, but I do find, just to make my point of departure, the new pact for Europe, that there is a, a considerable gap between the suggestions of the new pact for Europe and the social realism of Europe as it is today. Um, the pact speaks about common social standards, it speaks about convergence to a certain extent, it speaks about uh, increasing social investments, uh, social protections in the member states driven from uh, the European Union. And the main thing that really speaks <laughs> against um, this kind of initiative is that we have very considerable divergences within the member states also in terms of uh, social convergence and, and social investment. And these are differences that increases over time, has increased over time. Uh, just to illustrate, and I'm sorry for those who have seen it before, but I think it's a very good illustration of what uh, immense challenges that a social Europe is facing today is this um, recent analysis of social investment in Spain and the increased regional differences in uh, social investment in terms of social protection and education in one of the southern member states. So a, a difference that has increased and is now close to 60% between leaders and laggards in Spain in terms of social investment. So how can the European Union produce common social standards if common social standards are not really uh, uh, high on the political agenda within the member states. That's one of the first immense challenges of a social union. So we need to ask where are the drivers for um, the social Europe as it is today, where should we find the entrepreneurship? Can it be the commission? That's the first kind of question that we need to ask. Is the commission a social entrepreneur as it is today? The initiatives that the Commission has taken so far seems to be more of reactive character. It reacts to demands from the member states or it reacts to uh, the European Parliament. So it's not really proactive. It doesn't really have to uh, have an independent social vision or agenda as it is today. Can the European Court then be a driver of social rights and of um, social kind of uh, regulation? As a matter of fact, it is so that the third most area where the court has produced jurisprudence, where it has produced case law, is within the social policy area. It is dealing with social security for migrant workers and so forth. So the European Court is indeed a very active uh, actor institution also when it comes to social Europe. But of course, we need to question whether uh, those ca that case law is implemented 
Does it create general social standards? Or is it rather an entity that is dismantling social Europe as we know it today? This is a big challenge also to Europe of today. So in my view, there is a great need. There is a call for political responses also to, to uh, the social challenges of today. And it cannot be solved by recommendation or high aspirations, which has no binding uh, um, obligation to the member state. We need binding legislation also to address the real social challenges of today. So how does it look in terms of binding legislation as of today in the European Union? Is the European Union able to produce solution, address the, the social uh, worries of, of the member states and the population? That is the question. If we look to the state of uh, binding regulation in the European Union, at first sight it doesn't look too good. We have had the maternity directive proposed by the Commission, which was first in 2008, but was withdrawn in 2000, 2014, due to no progression in the political negotiation in the European Union. We have had the Monty II regulation, which was set to solve the problems, challenges created between the, uh, the right to collective actions and the free movement principles, and that was uh, um, challenged by the national parliaments and withdrawn by the Commission again. And we have had the working time direct directive, which was withdrawn or failed by the social partners to negotiate a solution for that. But it's not the same as saying that we have had a political standstill. At the same time, we have had the adoption of the Patient Rights Directive, which may not increase uh, cross-border healthcare as much as it was envisioned by the Commission or envisioned by the Court, but at least it's there. And we have had an enforcement directive uh, for the posting of workers, which is perhaps one of the most important achievements that Social Europe has had within recent years. And one of the groundbreaking uh, compromises that was made with that enforcement directive was a principle of joint and several liability or chain re responsibility for the construction sector. It was actually made an uh, obligatory uh, principle uh, in the first uh, part of the chain, at least. But it is important uh, because it is groundbreaking in terms of the regulation and legislation in many of the member states. But of course, there is nothing groundbreaking in the European Union without an exemption also. So it is also so that if member states show due diligence, whatever that means, they do not need to have an obligatory uh, uh, chain responsibility. And I think it's very interesting to see how that is also part of the Danish election campaign as it's unfolding now. When I saw it yesterday, what's the news? There was no mentioning of the enforcement directive, but it's a hot theme, at least in the Danish election campaign. So there are a lot going on also in terms of binding regulation in the European Union. We may not like the content, we may not think it's sufficient to tackle the challenges, but it is not a European Union which is not able to produce binding legislation. And this is kind of the development, and we see clearly here that most binding regulation in the European Union has been produced um, in regards to social security for migrant workers. That was the original kind of social dilemma that the union was set to tackle and it continues to be the most productive area of binding regulation within the European Union. And that of course brings us to the mobility package that is uh, expected to be proposed by the Commission in December 2015 where the Commission at least has taken a new stand. It was not willing really to negotiate very much in the beginning but it now seems open to negotiate exportability of family benefits, at least to a certain degree. It also seems to be willing to negotiate uh, aggregation of unemployment uh, benefits and so forth. So there are moves, but it's not really put forward by grand vision or mm -hmm. eventually not as envisioned by the new Pact for Europe. But at least there are moves, there are certain uh, dynamics also within social Europe as of today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. So, yes, and then we'll have Jon Quist from Roskilde University mm -hmm. also having five minutes around that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. So what uh, do you think about the new Pact for Europe report? 
If I may return to that, after I've just said a little okay. bit more. <laughs> so I think I'd like to take over the ball from uh, Dorte. So as Dorte said, uh, EU has very much dealt with the mobility uh, of workers, of their social rights. That has been the main occupation of the <coughs> European Union. And that dates back to 58. So it was the third piece of legislation in the EU that dealt with the uh, rights of uh, migrant workers. Uh, these rights were made at a time when the EU consisted only of six countries, six countries mm -hmm. that all had uh, uh, the inheritance from uh, Bismarck. They had obligatory uh, social insurance schemes that were based on a male breadwinner who went out working while his wife were at home with the children. And because he was working, he was then getting rights that was not only supposed to provide for him, but for his whole family. So therefore, he earned rights to the children and this is part of the conundrum today, that we have legislation that caters for these social insurance schemes where it is the worker who earns right on individuals who may not even be in the country, but then can be exported from uh, one country to another. And this is uh, creating uh, some confusion uh, today when we are trying to promote uh, equal opportunity, dual earner uh, households, make it feasible also for single uh, solo parents to participate in the labor market and what have you. So, so the inheritance that we have from the EU and social policy is very much centered on social insurance and on mobility. Uh, then more recently, in 2013, we had a relaunch of the uh, social dimension in Europe. It was called the uh, Social Investment Pact. And this is what I'm gonna talk a little bit uh, about now. So uh, the Social Investment Pact came at a time when there had been loads of uh, austerity measures so I guess that one could see or interpret the timing of the Social Investment Pact as the EU or the European Commission trying to show a more human face uh, to the EU. In fact, there was not so much new in it. The, the new thing was that you took a lot of different policies and put them under the same umbrella. You took some of the uh, targets uh, of uh, diminishing uh, poverty, of reducing the rates of uh, early school leavers, of increasing employment, and put that under this uh, umbrella of the uh, Social Investment Pact. Now, for those of you uh, who are not uh, Danes, when you see this uh, beautiful swan, you may not think of this aggressive bird, <laughs> but you may think of the uh, fairy tale by H.C. Anderson of the uh, little uh, ugly duckling. As you know, this is a story yes. about uh, a swan egg that was placed wrongly in a uh, duck nest, and it had a really bad childhood. It was uh, mobbed by its siblings, and I don't think even its parents cared much for it. Uh, so it had a terrible childhood, a ter terrible adolescence, and it was only when it was reaching uh, 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 to the end of its adolescence that it was looking in the lake, sorry, it was looking up in the sky and it was seeing some beautiful swans uh, flying over the uh, lake. It looked into the lake and it saw its mirror image that it was also a swan, and then it drifted off and joined the others and lived happily ever after. <laughs> <laughs> That's the story of the Ugly Doctor. As you probably know, we do not believe in fairy tales in the Nordic countries. <laughs> <laughs> we believe that it matters a lot where you are born, when you are born, and who your parents are. These three things do not have uh, any discretion on behalf of the individual. That's just destiny. And as we see today in Europe, people face very different destinies. So the rationale for social policies here is to go in and try to reduce some of the inequalities of some of the inefficiencies that is created by being placed in the wrong nest, in the wrong place by parents who may for various reasons not be so, uh, so advantaged as uh, others. So this is what social investment uh, is all about. We, ha we heard this morning that Europe is facing a lot of economic crisis and challenges. Another challenge that's going uh, through mm -hmm. Europe in the moment is that, that mm -hmm. of the aging populations, that the uh, 68 generation who were preaching that we should make love and not war, mm -hmm. didn't make so many babies as they were saying they should have done. <laughs> <laughs> and for that reason, there is an increasing share of our populations that are old and a smaller share of our population who are of a working age. So increasing employment is very high on the agenda, not only for social and economic reasons, but also for these demographic reasons if we want uh, to continue our levels of welfare. So the idea with the uh, social investment uh, way of thinking is that uh, things tend to have an accumulative impact over life, that what happens early in our lives may affect us later on. 
So if we are exposed to uh, bad stuff early in our lives, uh, smoking, bad childcare institutions, what have you, it may have repercussions also when we are young, when we enter school, we may not have the right social cultural language codes that is making it feasible for us to excel in the, uh, in the educational system and that will in turn impact on our labor market uh, performance. So the idea of social investment is that you make some policies early on in the expectation that this may benefit you in the longer run, maybe in other uh, systems. So uh, here we have a, a scratch course in Danish. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, this is your life going from left to right. So you start as a child. Well, actually, you start in the womb of your mother. In fact, a lot of research shows that it's most important what happens in there while uh, the uh, woman is uh, pregnant. Then you come out. And then at one stage, you go from being a child, an infant, a toddler, to become youth and enter the primary school, secondary school, and what have you. And at one stage or another, you enter adulthood, and hopefully you uh, get a place uh, in the labor market. And after a more volatile uh, career than uh, your parents' generations, you then at some stage uh, retire and spend some years uh, in retirement. Now, the thing is that all this is undergoing a lot of social and structural change, that there are bigger differences now between when we uh, move from one stage to another, and that some of our policies are then supposed to go in and help us make those transitions, to help us make the transition from the schooling system, for example, to a place in the labor market. That's uh, behind this uh, idea of reducing the rate of uh, early school leavers, for example. <coughs> so if you see your functional capacity, then in the start, Oops. Uh, in the start, you have a very quick growth and development of your uh, skills. Then there's a, a period where it's about maintainment and then about prevention of deterioration. And under a certain threshold, you're handicapped, you need help to, to make it through life. This is at the blue line, and this is symbolizing the uh, egg that was in a dog's nest. The red one is the egg in a swan's nest. So as you can see, it differs a lot how we go through life. We are going through trajectories of what happened yesterday will have an, have an impact upon how we do today and the day uh, after. So there's a difference here, which is an, another way of saying that there's a, a space for intervention where you can improve uh, the life uh, of uh, people. If we look at it in terms of policies, uh, you can see that we have many, 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 many different policies. So we start by trying to find out who are the children who are uh, living in uh, a disadvantaged background. How can we go in and uh, help them? Later on, uh, but to very extent in our countries, we have nurseries, childcare institutions, what have you. Then come schools, study, study departments, what have you. Active labor market policies, pension policies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These policies in turn create a lot of different uh, returns. So the idea is, in other words, to make the economic and social case for making social policy. That's what investments is about. And that's partly inspired by James Hickman, for example, from the US. So uh, I'm, I'm sad to say that some of the best research on this is actually coming from the other side of the Atlantic. Why are we interested in this? That's because often when people can take care of themselves, uh, it is cheaper for society. And we also know that people like to be autonomous. Uh, so it's a win-win uh, type of situation. And this was just to symbolize the uh, mobility discussion, but I will not go into that. And then hopefully we can have more time to discuss who, who have the possibilities of making these social investments. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. I think um, I'd like to, to, to put a question for all three of you. Uh, Jean-Claude Juncker has uh, said that he called for social minimum wage in all member countries. Um, should EU define minimum standards? Uh, and uh, should include uh, a certain <coughs> level of minimum wage. Dorte? Um, on, a, on a normative um, point of view, uh, I'm unable to, to address that uh, thing but, or, or that question. Uh, because actually I think it, a minimum wage kind of standard is 
uh, intervening very much in the traditional organization of, of labor markets. So I'd rather address it from a kind of, again, political realism uh, setup. And, and there I think that the minimum wage will uh, face immense uh, difficulties. Um, and I think that if the union is taking initiatives on which social standards should be set, it has to be um, willing also to enforce those standards. I don't think that, that the union can simply make a new kind of soft law, best practice kind of exchange of what should be social standards or, or social clauses. It has to be enforceable. Okay. Leonidas? Well, I would say that this appears as one of the biggest challenges in the EU. I deeply believe that uh, even from my more humanist perspective and more abstract one, it's quite obvious that there are profound differences among EU countries, and that's why it's very difficult to expect us to have you know, a common denominator coming soon. You cannot lightly compare the Nordic countries and say the Baltic states, or even going you know, deeper and analyzing differences between the newcomers to the EU and all their members. It's very difficult because I guess it reflects many things here. My colleagues mentioned, for instance, the austerity measures. So just try to imagine the kind of domino effect when you have a profound economic crisis and then you expect something happened to the country where the austerity measures produced a huge wave of emigrations. And that's why to think about their own immigrants is not a priority to say. So they think about themselves and in a way, it reflects, you know, a sort of mentality of the countries that produce their own austeriat. You know, the term precariat, which is the substitute for proletariat. But now, economies suggest that we have instead austeriat. The austerity measures produce the new kind of people who are extremely vulnerable, fragile, very insecure. And they tend to go somewhere trying to find jobs. So that's why I'm just afraid that, you know, to engage in beautiful rhetoric about caring for the other is one thing, but to have a viable policy, a social policy, is something very different. What the EU practices and policies proved was that the adoption of joint or common human rights policy was easier than social policy. Mm -hmm. And I guess that human rights discourse, it's more or less doing fine. If we take human rights, I don't think that the East and West divide works because there are profoundly democratic countries in Central Europe. But at the same time, I have to say that it's very difficult because I clearly see how difficult it was after the EU enlargement process. Take the UK with lots of Polish, Lithuanian, Latvian workers, take Ireland, for instance. And we know that when it comes to the political campaign or the political elections, we know the rhetoric of David Cameron, for instance. When they try to fish in the same waters, when you keep uh, United Kingdom Independence Party with the Mr. Nigel Farage fish. So it's just about the same. It's how to regain the electorate, which is at risk of being hijacked by the UKIP. This is to say that anti-immigration and anti foreigner campaign acquires a very special meaning even in profoundly democratic countries. This is much the same about Hert Wilders in the Netherlands, David Cameron, although Cameron is, a, I would say, the center-right politician. It's quite difficult, and I think that we should be absolutely fair-minded at this point. We have to think about, um, about citizens and foreigners, not only in the sense of you know, some sort of abstract policies, but very concrete situations very concrete increase, very concrete challenge in terms of, you know, demographic imposition, insecurity, unsafety. The least, uh, last but not least, my example concerning the vote concerning immigration in the UK, trying to exclude immigrants, which tells a lot about how complex it is to be fair at this point. But a mi minimum wage will be a very yeah. a strong yeah. provocation, yeah. political provocation towards, for instance, the uh, United Kingdom and other mm -hmm. countries and it would not solve the problems of the discussion on the benefits tourism. It would me merely uh, emphasize the conflicts, political conflicts in European societies. Uh, and Jonquist, uh, you emphasize the question of social investment more than the discussion of these kind of things. In the new pact for Europe, there is also the idea of having some kind of social minimum rights uh, with some obliga obliga obligations for member states. Uh, but do you think that, that uh, the Commission should push this agenda, as Juncker nearly tried to do it, with his <laughs> statement? Well, 
uh, there's a fine balance between a researcher and, uh, <laughs> and having political beliefs. Uh, what I can note as a researcher is that the uh, existence of uh, minimum wages or of uh, poverty lines does not necessarily create better wages or less poverty. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's very much in the Anglo-Saxon countries that you've adapted these sort of things, and that's not where you have the highest wages or the best uh, social standards. So I, I think that uh, rather than doing that, there may be other more efficient ways of doing it. Uh, and uh, one of them is perhaps to try to think uh, in new terms, instead of thinking in terms of compensation or guarantee of uh, certain uh, rights, then think of how can we avoid various bad risks from occurring and how can we enable people to cope with those risks when they do occur? Uh, as we heard earlier, we're living in a, in a risk society where many more of us are exposed to many more uh, risks uh, during our life course. But the question of social rights is also closely related to the internal market and mobility, and we have quite low mobility inside the European Union still. I think about 4% of the population, mm -hmm. 8 million people, are living in other EU countries. And uh, we have one question in the video. I think we could just have this because we have some young students uh, with the yeah. European Academy in the think tank. And there's Hello, a question my here. Name is Marie. Should Marie, be loud. And I study uh, European business and French no. at CBS. More, please. My name is Marie, and I study uh, European business and French at CBS. I have a question, and it is how do we solve the future demand for cross border pension in order to support the free movement for workers? I think that's a question for you, Jon. You touched upon the demographic <laughs> burden. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, as as uh, daughter also sketched, there is quite an extensive uh, ca case law on uh, the uh, mobility of workers and their social rights. So, you do have rules that are coordinating having worked in different countries where you can accumulate your insurance periods and get it paid out uh, later on. Mm. Uh, so, I think that for a lot of the pension schemes, uh, this is already in place where well, it may not be so much in places with regard to the occupational pension schemes. But here I would be walking on more thin ice than I would like to. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm not sure how, uh, without, to what extent this is uh, dealt with. But Do, the, but do you want to add something? No, yeah. just to say also, as Jon is saying, that the cross-border uh, exportability of pension is actually functioning quite well. It's one of the most uh, developed kind of schemes within the social security for migrant workers. But there are, of course, additional uh, problem of occupational pension and the whole uh, question about sufficiency of pension in specific member states, which is a real challenge also to the demographic uh, developments within the Union, which is also a problem that the European Union has to address if it somehow takes uh, serious what it says um, officially about social cohesion, of course. Okay. We have another video here. Hi, my name is Nadia. I study law at the University of Copenhagen. I have a question. In the European Union, a broad segment of persons have a right to a very broad range of social advantages. That makes it possible for people working only 10 to 12 hours a week to gain the right to benefits in the host country. How should a new welfare bargain deal with the fact that the legislator left it to the court to define the terms worker and the terms social advantages? I think it's a question for you, daughter. I think mm -hmm. it was very difficult to hear. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. gaining access to social advantages and? It's, it's uh, if you leave it to the court to determine the social rights mm -hmm. in yes. Europe. And that maybe could be a problem for legitimacy in yeah, the absolutely. European Union. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think it is, that is a, a very specific problem to the European Union if these uh, fundamental political questions are left within the courtroom. If it's a court who are mm -hmm. to solve the perhaps uh, big, a big cleavage also and a conflict line in the European Union. So, um, but I'm not, you know, all that convinced that the um, uh, court jurisprudence also have the impact that we often uh, think it has or assume it has. If we go into studies of actually looking into the general impact of, of the case law of the court, it is very fragmented it is uh, sometimes not complied with, it is reinterpreted by the member states both within administrative practices, in uh, legislative responses, so domestic politics, and also actually in, in national courtrooms. So uh, perhaps we have had a tendency also to overemphasize, overstate the impact of, of the European court on actual policies. 
the way that the court can have uh, um, an impact if it, if, if it is if it is used by uh, domestic actors, if it's really brought forward, put as pressure on changing domestic politics and so forth, then it may work quite efficiently to produce general impact, but in most circumstances actually left a little bit. It's, it's not producing the amount of impact that you should expect if you look into the increasing amount of case law and we see all the, the uh, bashes of now the court has said this and it will dismantle our uh, collective bargaining system, our right to collective action, it will bring about uh, a cross-border uh, uh, healthcare system and so forth and so forth because when it comes to implementation, the impact is diminishing considerably of what the court has said. But of course the court is addressing, you know, uh, some fundamental principles, but it's actually for politics to decide then what is to be the impact of uh, that uh, key point that the, the court has made. Do you think you could explain that to the, the Danish citizens in the election campaign? <laughs> um, no, but I, I, no, I, I, I certainly cannot. That's, that's Why not? Sure. You're because very clear. I'm a scholar. So, and, and that would be a, a, a too deep gap to, to, to surpass, I think. Um, but, but I think it's ac ab absolutely important that we have more research in seeing into what is the impact of the court's decisions in mm. order to address that question of, of legitimacy in an adequate way. Mm. So, yeah, thank you. You ask about it? Yeah, so if we look at the numbers of students, for example, coming to mm. countries where you have universal study grant schemes and what have you, uh, which I guess was the case you was referring to, then indeed there has been a, a, a marked increase over the last few years compared to how many students who are in, for example, in Denmark, the proportion is still very slow, uh, very low. So you have a, a rapid increase, but still a low uh, proportion. The same can be said for social assistance, unemployment insurance benefits, and what have you. I think one of the important points though is whether or not this is an economic good business for the country that are hosting these people or not, may not be the only part of the story we should look at. Uh, if you recall back a few years ago, Denmark became famous because of a person called Robert. Robert, uh, he was named Lazy Robert. Uh, and he the created- Front page of the New York Times, I think. Front page of the New York yeah. Times. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure he's one of the, uh, the clients of the social uh, assistance system that has had the most impact upon a social assistance reform ever, ever. <laughs> Now imagine that Robert was not a Dane, but from Poland and was called Powell, you know. This would have created an even bigger uh, stir and would have made politicians react, even though that it may not have been an economic problem, then the issue of legitimacy that the uh, takes up can create uh, reactions for politicians where they would tend to make access a bit more difficult, reduce the level of benefits. In other words, moving to a lower uh, level of generosity than you would have had without the fear of uh, foreign or European uh, Roberts. Uh, okay. Yes, would you uh, try to uh, solve uh, the dilemma here of legitimacy? Uh, well, I would say that all those things somehow have much to do with the with the character, with the political character of the EU in the future, in the coming years and decades. Because clearly, uh, it's one story if we will have you know the European Union, you know, more or less approaching the paradigm of you know. David Cameron, so becoming just common market, you know, and with profound differences among member states. And another thing, if the EU is bound to become a federation or confederation in the future, so meaning that the unification of social policies and fiscal unity, and all of those things, it would change the character of the EU and would make it more competent in many ways. If this doesn't happen, then I think that it would be a dilemma how to stick with reality, with the fact that there are profound differences in social policy among member states, and the fact that we should have a common denominator. And failing to achieve this would have many, many court cases, again, which is very much the same with human rights issues, that Strasbourg Court of Human Rights indicates the profound differences among member states. But the point is here that, again, something tells me that when we think about the tension between welfare statism of the Nordic countries, for instance, and the neoliberal model, very <coughs> deeply embedded in the Baltic states, something tells me that what we're going to have in the future is a sort of hybrid, hybrid thing. I don't believe that neither will prevail completely. 
It's like in higher education. We see that, you know, in higher education, there is something profound in British. And I thought for a long time, probably with my naivete, that even such country as Finland would resist until the very end. No, they accepted the British model, more or less, which tells me about the necessity somehow to stick to the fact of life, that there will be a something hybrid here. Maybe we'll open up for a few questions, and if you have questions to the question of the benefit tourism, please raise your hands. Oh, nobody has an interest in that topic here. Oh, it's great. This is not an election campaign. One question here. Yes, okay. If I, I try to fill the, the void then. Mm -hmm. My question is related, as you said, to Kasper Sotom and Jim Sefansia. So uh, my question is related to this. Uh, uh, welfare tourism and also the calculations actually that have been done in Denmark in relation to uh, how much the migrant workers have contributed to Denmark as, and, and also uh, uh, related also to the calculations that have been made as to um, uh, as to the if, if the young people of Denmark who were born after 84 would be ever able to, con uh, to contribute back to the Danish state the, the, the benefits they have that they have received. So my question is rather about the uh, about the contribution of the migrant workers to the Danish economy. Have you is calculated? It to who knows the answer? You know? <laughs> my colleagues, I guess. Yes. So the uh, the uh, question: Have you calculated also in the cost of educating the uh, migrant labor force that have been? Uh, sort of spend in countries like Poland, that was mentioned, and Lithuania, and Lithuania or Latvia for that matter. Have you calculated that in as well into, uh, into how much the migrant workers have uh, uh, contributed to the Danish economy? Thank you. Um, I think that it has been really interesting to follow the debate on how to calculate the netto uh, benefits made by, by migrant workers or, or, or deficits, uh, whatever. Uh, where your kind of calculative point is. Uh, so in the beginning it was calculated on exactly your, how much tax did you pay and how much benefits did you receive. Then the model was extended because that actually show, showed a surplus, a kind of considerable surplus uh, uh, for, from migrant workers. Then it was extended also to, to consider, because it's not really possible to calculate in exact manner, then the social services that migrant workers received in terms of educational <coughs> to access to the educational system, healthcare system, and so forth. But in that model, when it was extended, and then it was more, much more mixed picture, uh, it didn't actually also incorporate the kind of social capital that migrant workers came along with free education, uh, high education, many times from uh, the sending member states, some of coming along with PhDs and so forth. Uh, that was not taken into the model's uh, calculation. And now I think the, the, the debate has moved on to whether there is a, a retrenchment effect uh, of actually uh, works uh, that, that uh, migrant workers is accessing, whether that is uh, retrenching Danish from accessing the same kind of work. So the model is, is Developing all the time, but to have an exhaustive model, I have not seen yet. Question down there. Yeah, um, this is Christopher Dorn. Um, David Cameron has put on the agenda that he wants a revision of these rules, and at least, or he wants an exception for uh, an early up period for at least four years for some benefits and so on. And the Commission is, has probably to some way come up with some kind of proposal to at least to look into whether there is the need for revising. I think it's regulation 8H3 slash 04. I thought you know that better than I do. Um, how do you, I mean, do you follow all this, these debates in all these countries? Do you see that there is any scope for a revision? And in, in, in that case, in what areas would there be a revision? Could you see that there would be any exemption for Britain in this area? Uh, I mean, even there's, uh, the new Polish president is a, is a was until now an MEP in the same group as David Cameron's people, I hardly can see that he can go to Poland and, and agree to, to something that would discriminate against Polish workers. So um, how do you see what is coming up and what, how will it end? Uh, <laughs> uh, I think the, the commission... One, one minute, 30 seconds. <laughs> 
The Commission is under uh, considerable pressure here uh, due to the latest development in the UK, of course. They will have to, to uh, open a revision of the regulation again, but unable to uh, get um, the political uh, agreement on all that Cameron is demanding. That will probably be the, be, be the outcome of, of the political negotiations. So I think it's important to see how the Commission has shifted position on the mobility package and in particular the 883 regulation. So in the beginning it wanted uh, to extend exportability of unemployment benefit from three to six months. So it was on the uh, vision that we should promote free movement. But with the new commission it is much more open to consider also the vision of exportability of family benefits. Uh, eventually opening towards indexation of family benefits or uh, creating some kind of individual rights instead of derived rights uh, to family benefits and also the whole thing about aggregation of unemployment benefits. And I think that agenda is somehow uh, approaching uh, what uh, Cameron can also sell back home. But of course the four year period is very out of, of line with, uh, with uh, the regulation, the treaty, it will go against the treaty, it will open up to a, or it should demand a treaty revision, and we know very well that that is impossible. But he really touches upon with this question also the dilemmas of you know Eastern European countries yeah. with the need and, and pushing forward this agenda. They want the openness Absolutely. of the European community. Yeah, and therefore I think it's very important also to, to kind of uh, look further into the whole political uh, negotiations on the enforcement directive. Because there, in the beginning, Poland was together with the UK. This was about the internal market. It was not about permitting more national control in terms of hosting firms and so forth. But in the very end of negotiation, the UK shifted position, no, Poland shifted position, uh, be away from the alliance with the UK and actually kind of made friendship with France. So there is a lot going on also in terms of who is with who and where alliances can be made also between uh, old member states and new member states. And for the fun of it, the new Polish president is a member of the same, or his party is a member of the same group yeah. as Cameron's party. So we have a lot of fun there <coughs> yeah. as well. I think we'll close here. We have uh, two other sessions coming up right now. Thank you very much, Lorne, Leonidas, and Jung. Thank you for your